Galatians 2, Leviticus 13, Romans chapter 7. Galatians 2, Leviticus 13, Romans 7. We're going to start in Galatians 2. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, Lord, I do thank you again for this time with your word. And Lord, I thank you because you are righteous. And I thank you and praise you, Lord, because your judgments are upright. And I thank you, Lord, for being the wonderful God that you are, for being the only God that is. And I thank you, Lord, because your testimonies are righteous and true. They speak of you, and we see your holiness and your goodness and your grace and mercy upon us. And Lord, your word is very pure. And Lord, because your word is pure, your servants do love it. God, I thank you because we can trust your word and know that it is true from in to amen. And Lord, despite what this world may do, despite what this world may say, and despite if all friends and family leave, Lord, I pray we would still stay true to your word that we would stay close to you and know that you are our refuge and fortress and that your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and that your law is truth. And despite what men may say, and despite how Congress may reject it, your word is always true. And Lord, I pray that this time would bless you that Jesus Christ would be exalted and lifted up. And I pray, God, that we would think on these things this day and every day. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Galatians chapter 2, and drop down to verse 17. Galatians chapter 2, verse 17. And Paul writes, But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, in this culture of self-esteem that we have nowadays, people are left with the inability to see and understand the depths of their sinfulness. Nobody likes to be told that they are sinful people and that there is nothing good about them in their relationship with Jesus Christ. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. There is none that are righteous. Even for the disciples of Jesus Christ, we have a hard time grasping the holiness of God and the unholiness of ourselves. Furthermore, there are those that profess Christianity, but they have not changed in their lifestyle from when they made a profession of faith. If Jesus Christ has not changed you, then you are not saved by Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. 
Behold, all things are become new. You cannot be justified by the works of the law as given to Moses. You cannot be justified by the works of the flesh, the works that you have decided that will make you righteous in the eyes of the Lord God. Many believe that they have made a profession of faith on Jesus Christ's gospel. His death on the cross is the only possible payment for your sins, his burial, and his resurrection, but have seen no difference in their lives. They continue to talk like they used to talk. They continue to behave like they used to behave, and their thoughts and imaginations continue to be the same. Jesus Christ makes a difference in people's lives when he washes them in his own blood and makes them clean when they have professed with their mouth faith on Jesus Christ and have repented of their sins. Jesus Christ is what all the difference in, the, in their lives, and it is not by their own good works and actions that they are justified and declared righteous in the eyes of God. Sadly, recently, there was some sort of testimony in our Congress, and one of the representatives read into, read before everybody there, some passages of Scripture talking about this new bill that's coming up, the Equality Bill. And he spoke out what, what God says in his word and thinks about these things. And one of the, the leaders of the Congress, after he was done reading scripture, he said, quite bluntly, the will of God has nothing to do with the decidings of this Congress. Yikes. That's a scary thought for that man, Jerry Nadler, to make a statement like that. You're going to have to answer for that one day. You'll be called to judgment by God. Not by me, but by God. God will take care of it. And if he doesn't repent, I fear for him. Now there are plenty of people that behave correctly, and they say the right things, and they do the right things, but you cannot read their minds and see the inferno of sin roiling inside. If they were judged by their fellow men and their neighbors, they would be considered good people. How often have you heard in the news about men and women that have committed horrific crimes, and their neighbors and their co-workers have described them as being nice or good neighbors? Outwardly, these men and women behaved like anyone else. However, their sin will eventually reveal itself for all to see as they are unable to contain it anymore and they begin to act upon their sin. First it begins in their thoughts and imaginations and then it is revealed in small actions and words, growing in gradual intensity before it erupts into shameless sin. Not everyone reveals an all-out corruption of sin in their lives. In fact, most people keep the sin mostly bottled up, and it reveals itself in small ways until the sinner is unable to get it back under control. Keep your finger here in Galatians, but now go over to Le Leviticus chapter 13. Leviticus chapter 13. Leviticus chapter 13. Several years ago, we went through chapters 13, 14, 15 of Leviticus and saw how le leprosy and, the, and what God is talking about with leprosy, leprosy is a picture of sin in a man's life. And in Leviticus chapters 13 through 15, the Israelites are instructed on what to do when a person shows spots of leprosy on their skin and what to do with those people. These three ch chapters demonstrate that leprosy is a picture of sin in your lives. Chapter 13, let's go to verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or bright spot, 
and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priests. And the priest shall look on the plague in the skin of the flesh. And when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. Now if a man or a woman had a spot, scab, or rising of the flesh on their body, it could have been leprosy. And the Lord instructs Moses and Aaron on how to identify if it is leprosy or some other disease. We have to keep in mind that the leprosy of the Bible is different than what we think of leprosy today. I think what they call it today more often is Han, Han's disease. And that usually also involves the loss of feeling and sensation in, in all over, really. And um, the, event, the eventual degradation of skin and everything else. The leprosy in the Bible seems to be a little bit different from what we think of it as today, but it was still, in both cases, something that was very contagious. Now the Lord instructs Moses and Aaron here how to identify if it is leprosy, or if it's a plague, or if it's something else. It could be just one spot, but if it is leprosy, then the person must be separated from the rest of the Israelites because the person is unclean and could further spread the leprosy. Now I want you to note here in this passage, it talks of how the infected man or woman is to be brought to Aaron, the high priest, or one of his sons who are also priests. Why does the Lord state that the leper was to go to a priest instead of a doctor? And when you read through the Old Testament, you will read of leprosy being used by God to punish someone that was disobedient and sinful. Moses' sister, Miriam, was stricken by the Lord God with leprosy for seven days after she and Aaron had spoken out against Moses. The prophet Elisha, his helper Gehazi, was inflicted with leprosy after sinning against the Lord. Uzziah, one of the kings of Judah, was given leprosy by the Lord after Uzziah attempted to initiate his own worship of the Lord through the burning of incense, something only the priests were to do. And Uzziah had leprosy the rest of his days. And when you read the New Testament, whenever Jesus Christ encountered lepers, the Bible states that he cleansed them of their leprosy, not that he healed them of their leprosy. For example, in Matthew chapter 8, it reads, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now, if a man or a woman had leprosy, they were to be separated because it could spread to others. And likewise with sin, if a person is dwelling in unrepentant sin and refuses to repent, they are to be set apart from the congregation because their sin could be spread to others. And as we read here in verses 1 through 3, if a man or a woman had a scab or a spot, or a rising, and even if it was only one spot, they were to go to the priest to be examined. Now drop down to verse 9. Leviticus 13, verse 9. When the plague of leprosy is in a man, then he shall be brought unto the priest. And the priest shall see him, and behold, if the rising be white in the skin, and it have turned the hair white, and there be quick raw flesh in the rising, it is an old leprosy in the skin of his flesh. And the priest shall pronounce him unclean, and shall not shut him up, for he is unclean. And if a leprosy break out abroad in the skin, and the leprosy cover all the skin of him 
the half of the plague from his head even to his foot. Wheresoever the priest looketh, then the priest shall consider. And behold, if the leprosy hath covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean that hath the plague. It is all turned white, he is clean. But when raw flesh appeareth in him, he shall be unclean. A lot in there, back and forth with that about leprosy and not leprosy. But if a person had only a spot or two of leprosy, they are unclean and to be separated. And if the spots were examined, and the spots were examined to see if they were only on the surface of the skin or if they went deep into the skin. And during this time, the man or woman were to be set apart from the rest. If the spots were determined to be only on the surface, then they were determined to not be leprosy and they could return to the congregation. If the spots were deep into the skin, then it is leprosy and they must continue to be considered unclean and set outside. And you can see by the examples given in the Bible of those that had leprosy, God is no respecter of persons. Moses' sister was placed outside the camp because of her leprosy. It didn't matter that she was Moses' sister. She was still put out of the camp. King Uzziah, Uzziah, one of the kings, when the Lord smote him with leprosy, even though he was a reigning king, Uzziah was still put outside of Jerusalem for the rest of his days, and his son was made king at that time. Sin begins internally, and in the thoughts and imaginations before it is seen on the outside and acted upon. And when you think about that with that, that's the idea of the leprosy being deep in the skin as opposed to being a surface thing. Now with all of this, what you should be doing now is reflecting on what you have learned from Paul's letter to the Romans and thinking on some of the passages that you've read there and will be there in a moment. But looking at verse 12 now, if the man or woman has leprosy break out abroad, that means that they are covered head to toe with the leprosy. There are no spots of raw flesh. Everything is covered with leprosy. Then the priest shall consider and behold, if the leprosy hath covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean that hath the plague. It is all turned white. He is clean. So what has happened here? The man's flesh is now all white, and the priest declares him to be clean. So in other words, the leprosy at this point is no longer contagious. It's all on the surface. It is all out, and it's all over his body. If there was even one spot of raw flesh, in other words, skin that hadn't been touched yet by the leprosy, then the man was considered to not be clean because the leprosy could still be lurking deep in the skin. The man or woman that has leprosy spread abroad has had their sin revealed, and it is no longer dwelling deep under the surface. And what this is, is the picture of the man or woman that sees the depth of the blackness and unholiness of the sins in their lives. And they realize that they have no hope unless they go to the great high priest, Jesus Christ, for cleansing. Remember again, they were cleansed of their leprosy. They were healed of their leprosy. They are holding no sin back. There is godly sorrow and remorse and repentance for their sins. And the, when the great high priest cleanses them in his own precious blood, they are made every whit whole and clean. They have thrown themselves at the feet of Jesus Christ in fear and trembling, begging for his forgiveness, and he has purged them from the eternal penalties of their sins. Jesus Christ has changed them because he has saved them. Leprosy or sin is still in the lives of those that are born again. Sadly, disciples of Jesus Christ can have sin in their lives and they can become like lepers. 
And like the leper, they may have only a spot or two of leprosy showing as they struggle with doing the things that they should not do, and they refuse to do the things that they should do and know they should do. Keep your finger here in Leviticus, but now go over to Romans 7. Romans 7. Go to the end. Romans chapter 7. And Paul writes, verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now the disciple of Jesus Christ may still seek to serve their flesh rather than the Spirit of God. And the result of that is that they are sinning against the Lord and they definitely lack the fear of the Lord in their lives. They become like the leper that has a spot or two of leprosy that can be seen. Their flesh wars against the Spirit and sadly, the flesh is winning. To be carnally minded only brings death, however, and more and more spots of leprosy and sin will be revealed for all to see. And despite the hardness of their heart, they are still attempting to serve the Lord, but it is only half-hearted service with no joy or peace. When you are spiritually minded, then joy and peace comes into your life. There is joy in serving the Lord. So I ask, what are you doing to feed yourself spiritually? If you are starving yourself spiritually, especially if you're seeking to only feed the body and mind, then you become like the leper that has spots that go deep into the flesh. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 reads, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. When you think what that, that means, you fear the Lord and depart from evil, it's health to your navel and the marrow to your bones. Those are the deepest parts of your body, if you will. The marrow, you can't go much deeper than to the bones. And your navel, that's right in the center. You know, and, and so when you are fearing the Lord and departing from evil, it brings health right down to your very core of your being. Proverbs chapter 6 reads, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. <coughs> a wounded dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wrapped, wiped away. Jesus Christ can make you clean. You must humbly come to him in repentance and faith and then take up your cross and follow him. You're going to have difficult days ahead. Isn't it better to have the good shepherd with you than for you to walk in your own direction? Fear the Lord and depart from evil. All right. Actually, we're done in, in Leviticus. We'll go back over now to Galatians chapter 2. We'll be back to Romans. Galatians 2. If we had good another couple hours, you'd see with Leviticus the depth of sin. And that's the idea, is, is that we just don't see how deep our sin really is. And so much of it is under the surface. It's, it's in a way like an iceberg. It floats so much of it is deep under the surface. And that's why it was considered such a serious disease leprosy was, that it needed to be taken care of and separated out until otherwise. But then when you look at it further, you get into chapter 15, and it talks about even essentially leprosy in the home. And if a home showed this, again, idea of the disease on the walls, 
There were things they were to do. They were not supposed to continue living there and move out and then check it again in a week. And if it got worse, they were to level the house and scatter the stones and start all over again. It's the same way with sin. Again, we have to take it serious. All right, Galatians chapter 2, verse 17 again. Of course, when you repented and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, he sanctified you and he justified you and his righteousness was applied to you. All of Jesus Christ and none of you. You had nothing good about yourself and any good there is now is because of Jesus Christ. He justified you so you can stand before the Lord and he sees you just as if you never sinned. Verse 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Now before salvation by Jesus Christ, you were condemned and found to be deserving of God's wrath bruising you. You hated the light, and you loved the darkness, and your deeds were evil and self-serving. You may not have seen them that way, but ultimately they were. When you believed on the gospel of Jesus Christ and repented of your sins, you were justified by him. So what is Paul writing here in verse 17? The Jew no longer thought that he was justified by keeping the law. Because the Jewish believer understood that he could not keep the law. So in order to be justified by Jesus Christ, the Jew had to realize that he is or her is a sinner. And so the question that Paul asks rhetorically here is, is Jesus Christ the one that makes the Jew a sinner? That's what he's asking through here. Is it Jesus Christ that made the Jew a sinner? And I thought about this for a bit, and I came up with this illustration. Think of it this way. For his whole life so far, a young man was raised as a Rockefeller. He had Rockefeller birthdays, and he lived at Rockefeller mansions. Then one day, he had a blood test done and discovered that he was not related to the Rockefellers. He was instead a Rothschild. Did the doctor that performed the blood test on the young man make him a Rothschild? No. He was always a Rothschild. He just did not know that he was until he was shown it. Likewise, a person does not fully realize that they are a sinner until it is revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. Does that mean that Jesus Christ made them sinners? No. That is why Paul wrote, God forbid. The Jew is a sinner because they were born that way. The Gentile is a sinner because they were born that way. The word of God revealed it to them that they are sinners in need of salvation. Before salvation, you were the servant of sin. You were a child of disobedience. Keep your finger here. we we'll go over now to Romans chapter 6. And that's how I saw life. I did not understand I was a sinner before I got saved. I thought I was good enough. I thought if you put everything on a scale, I had just enough good that it outweighed the evil. And, and I found all kinds of ways to justify my evil and compare to others and everything else. And finally, the word of God got through to me that I'm not good. Romans chapter 6 verse 20. For when you were the servants of sin, so Paul is talking to these Roman believers, he's saying in the past when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. That's a big statement. In other words, you lived as a sinner, you were free of God's righteousness. When you think about the the implications of that, 
That's huge. Because without God's righteousness applied to you, you're going to remain lost. You can say, yeah, I'm not that good a person. If you don't have the blood of Jesus Christ to purge your sins away and the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to you, you're still the servants of sin. Verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So in other words, what kind of fruit did you have in your life before you made a profession of faith on Jesus Christ? You may have had some good fruit that looked good, at least on the outside, but ultimately it wasn't God-pleasing fruit. It wasn't God-serving fruit. It was bad fruit. It was bitter. It was rotten. It was fruit that only brought death because you were ultimately carnally minded. So what kind of fruit is in your life today? Are you spiritually minded, which brings life and peace? Or have you gained a spot or two of leprosy? You have been justified by Jesus Christ. Now live by that faith on him alone. Continuing in verse, chapter 6, verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You are now a servant of God when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and repented of your sins. So you have now been made free from sin. And you're to be a, a servant of God, and therefore your fruit should be unto holiness and to the end, everlasting life. So make sure your fruits are unto holiness. When a spot of leprosy forms on you, repent of it and seek God's forgiveness. But I love how that, because we always isolate verse 23 in chapter 6 there, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, and we think we, we end up glossing over that somewhat. The wages of sin is death. More though than just the physical death, the wages of our sin are separation from God. And so before when you were a servant of sin, you only had death, eternal separation from God to look forward to. And that's what people don't get today because they would rather keep God at an arm's length. They would rather reject Jesus Christ and turn from him rather than realize that they are servants of sin. They're not as good as they think they are. They haven't been justified. We don't want to see that. The wages of sin is death. But God offers a gift, an eternal gift, the best gift that anyone could ever receive. And a gift that isn't returnable, a gift that cannot be taken away. It's an eternal gift, and that's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a wonderful thing he has done. Amen. And to think that he was declared guilty for me of my sins. What a wonderful thing he has done. I wish people would see that and think on that. And remember that. All right, go back over to Galatians. We're done in Romans. Galatians 2 again, verse, eight, verse 18. Galatians 2, verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. So why go back to the former way of living if it only leads to death? Why return to sins that have been forgiven and return to feeding the flesh? Why neglect your soul and spirit so you can feed your body and mind? Paul is stating in verses 18 and 19 that if he decides to go back to following the law, 
then he is sinning against the Lord. He becomes a transgressor. And he's going back to, if you were to go back to following the law, just like how the Jewish believers were doing, they were trying to put burdens onto the Gentiles by saying, oh, well, you know, you got saved by Jesus Christ, but now you need to do this and this and this as well. Why put yourself back under those burdens? Jesus Christ said, well, you that are heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. It's an eternal rest. Why go back to what will disturb you and bring you unrest and no peace and no joy? Because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, Paul was crucified with Jesus Christ and has become a dead man. And a dead man does not have to follow the law. He is made dead to the law. And now you likewise are able to live unto God. That is what justification by Jesus Christ does for you. One time you had spots of leprosy and sin on you. Your sin was deep and your thoughts and imaginations were wicked. Why return to that? Why return to behaving as a child of disobedience? Why will you die? Turn ye and repent. And rejoice in the great act that Jesus Christ has accomplished for you when he saved you and you were born again. Look to him and trust in him and continue to walk in that newness of life rather than returning to that old life. Sheep don't want, sheep don't, sheep don't waddle in the mud. That's not the right word. Wallow in the mud. Thank you. Sheep don't wallow in the mud. Why? Because their wool gets stuck in it. Stay on the dry ground, if you will. Stay where you're supposed to be. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that we can go from Galatians to, to Romans and to Leviticus and to see how it all so neatly fits together. That your word could only do that because it came from you, Lord. And that you have provided it for us to read and to reread. That it is your word and that every bit of it is true. And I thank you, God, for that. Thank you for what we can learn from this and be convicted of and be comforted by your word. And God, I pray that we would remember these things and we would think on these things as we go through the, this week. I pray, Lord, that we would trust you and look to you every day, knowing that you'll bring us through anything and everything, even if it ultimately results in our death. But even death, when a believer dies, they're with you. So... That's not losing, that's gaining. And God, I thank you that you justified us and that you loved us that much to do that for us. And Lord, I pray that daily we would remember that we are your ministers to others, serving you and serving others. And Lord, I pray we would look for those opportunities and we would act on them in obedience to you. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.